Hello, today with this Fern presentation, we will be discussing the care of emergency department patients with dizziness and vertigo in an attempt to appropriately diagnose and treat patients with a potential serious central etiology. My name is Edward Sloan. I'm an emergency physician in Chicago. I work with Fern, the Foundation for Education and Research in Neurological Emergencies, Fern.org. I have no financial conflicts. I'm the Fern President and Board Chair. If we believe there's true motion symptoms that are consistent with the consensus definition of vertigo, we then need to consider specifically the central and peripheral diagnoses related to the three vertigo types we referred to earlier. We again go to the EB Medicine Timing and Triggers approach by Dr. Edlow for more information. And we go back to table one and now consider in more detail the diagnoses to which we referred earlier. So again, there are three types of vertigo in green. There are benign diagnoses in yellow, six to be exact. And then there are four more serious diagnoses in red that correspond to these three diagnoses. Again, let's consider these three vertigo types. Is it continuous vertigo and the patient has the vertigo at the time of presentation? If it's continuous and current, that is defined as acute vestibular syndrome and that is a diagnosis that can be made regardless of the patient's disposition. But if it is not current and continuous and it's episodic in nature, those, diagno those diagnoses are either spontaneous episodic vertigo or triggered episodic vertigo. So let's now refer to the ATTEST system that was developed by Dr. Edlow to have a better understanding of those three types of vertigo. What does ATTEST stand for? Associated symptoms that we will determine during our history, the timing of the vertigo, the trigger of the vertigo, the examination signs, and some confirmatory testing that needs to be done. So this is the clinical pathway defined as a test. And you can see it flows through based on specific questions. And we will now go through those questions so you can better understand this clinical pathway. Bear in mind, there is some class of evidence definitions that supports these portions of the decision tree of the clinical pathway. So class one is obviously uh, supported by the best data. Class 2, less support, but still important to consider in virtually all cases. And then Class 3 would be the weakest support from case studies, etc. And at times there may be indeterminate levels of clinical support. So what is the first part of the attest clinical pathway? It interrogates the general medical cause of the dizzy vertigo symptoms. On this clinical pathway in the box in red, the first question is, does the history and physical suggest a general medical cause? Low volume, low hemoglobin, low glucose, low blood pressure. If the answer is yes, then you can go ahead and treat that etiology because it is important that a general medical cause such as hypovolemia be treated before we attribute the symptoms of the dizzy or vertiginous patient to some central or peripheral etiology. If the answer to the question, is there a specific general medical cause, if the answer is no, or if there's some attribute of their exam that is worrisome, such as worrisome nystagmus, you then go on to a different portion of the attest clinical pathway. Ask the first question, general medical cause, if yes, treat it, and then you can proceed to re-examine the patient after you've resolved that general medical cause. So, is there a likely medical cause if the answer is yes? And if there's no worrisome signs, you say that's correct, no worrisome nystagmus, the patient can sit and stand, no motor abnormalities, no arm dysmetria, they use their arm well, no vision, speech, swallow, or sensory changes, then you can treat the medical cause, and a CT generally does not have to be done unless there's something about the patient 
that causes concern. So what's part two of the ATTEST protocol? Part two of the ATTEST protocol or clinical pathway asks the simple question, has the dizziness been continuously present and does it persist at the time of the evaluation? If the answer is yes, it's continuous and it's present at the time of evaluation, you then can make the diagnosis of acute vestibular syndrome. Then the question becomes, what might be the cause? But we'll get to that in a bit. So you can see if you ask the question, continuous and present at the time of evaluation, the answer is yes. There's good evidence to support your ability to diagnose acute vestibular syndrome, and we'll talk more about that. If there's no likely medical cause, and or there's some possible worrisome nystagmus finding, for example, and if there's continuous and present vertigo, your diagnosis is acute vestibular syndrome. Now, if you diagnose acute vestibular syndrome, continuous vertigo, present at the time of evaluation, no apparent systemic cause, and you say, I think this patient has acute vestibular syndrome, you can then say it's either a peripheral etiology such as vestibular neuritis or neuronitis or labyrinthitis, which will involve some hearing loss. The altern alternate posterior circulation diagnosis would be an acute posterior circulation stroke, which of course is a clinical neurological emergency. What is part three of the ATTEST protocol? If the patient does not have continuous vertigo present at the time of evaluation, the vertigo then is assumed to be intermittent. And that intermittent episodic vertigo can either be spontaneous or triggered. So let's consider first spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome. That is, it occurs episodically or intermittently, and it appears to be spontaneous in its onset. We now move down to part three of the ATTEST protocol, where the question becomes, is this intermittent dizziness or vertigo triggerable? In other words, is some movement or some activity the cause of the dizziness? And if the answer is no, if you say no, it doesn't appear to be triggerable, it just occurs spontaneously for no apparent reason, then you go on to the diagnosis of spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome. So you say there's no likely medical etiology, but perhaps there's some worrisome nystagmus. And you say, okay, there's no continuous vertigo that's present at the time of my evaluation. And you say, is it triggered by standing up or head movement? If the answer is no, then you say, okay, it's spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome, a peripheral etiology that is more benign than a central etiology for spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome is Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine here in green. More serious causes either are a cardiac dysrhythmia, which is not neurological per se, or the important posterior circulation diagnosis of a posterior circulation TIA. So spontaneous episodic vestibular syndrome, spontaneous episodic peripheral Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine, central or more serious would be a cardiac dysrhythmia or a posterior circulation TIA. We're still in a test part three where we talk about episodic vertigo and ask whether it's spontaneous or triggered. So now we're gonna talk about triggered episodic vestibular syndrome. So we go back to our question, if the patient does not have constant dizziness present at the time of evaluation, and it appears to be episodic or intermittent, then the question is, is the dizziness trigger triggerable by some activity such as head movement? If the answer is yes, then we go on to consider 
the diagnoses related to triggerable episodic vestibular syndrome. So if triggered and episodic, you've said, look, there's no clear medical cause. Something appears to be not right, but they don't have continuous or vertigo present at the time of evaluation. And the patient says it appears to be triggered with head movement. If that's the case, the peripheral etiology, which is more benign, would be BPPV, which is positional vertigo, based on some triggered events such as head movement to one side. The more serious etiologies would either be significant systemic orthostatic hypotension, meaning you need to check orthostatics, or perhaps at times patient will have some posterior fossa lesion or tumor, which is a more central cause, which can on occasion cause triggered episodic vestibular syndrome. So you can see from determining the timing and triggers of the vertigo and determining what three types of vertigo or which of three it might be, you can then go on to what are reasonable assessments for possible likely peripheral or central etiologies. So now that we've discussed what are the possible peripheral and central etiologies to the patient with dizziness or vertigo, and with that, I say thank you. For any further information, I encourage you to go to fern.org or we can go to the fern.org channel and subscribe on YouTube. Or you can send us an email at fern.org at gmail.com. Thank you for your time and attention to this important clinical information related to the neurological emergency of acute vestibular syndrome in emergency department patients. I'm Edward Sloan. Again, thank you and have a good day.